given that AMD has just announced its Zen 3 microarchitecture and its Ryzen 5000 series processors, they reached out to me and asked if I'd like to spend some time interviewing their chief technology officer, Mark Papermaster. Mark and I have uh, had discussions over the years, a couple of interviews already published on Antec and a few other discussions that aren't so public. Uh, So AMD gave me this opportunity to quiz Mark about Zen 3 and the launch. Um, This was more about sort of products and AMD focused. Uh, AMD has specifically said they're doing a microarchitecture deep dive that's going to be, that sort of stuff is going to be under embargo until the review date. Uh, but we still managed to tease a few tidbits out from Mark. Um, and Mark's a great guy. He always <laughs> loves my questions. Uh, but yeah, we got a little glimpse of insight into the black box that is AMD. Um, now this interview, uh, I'll give a warning in advance. Um, my recording software wasn't working exactly perfectly. Uh, so we missed out a question and, uh, you can hear me typing all the way throughout. So I'm sorry if that bothers you. It, is what it is. Um, if you would like to read the transcript of the interview, um, head over to Anantech. It's all going to be there. Um, but I'd like to thank Mark for his time, Mark and his team for their time. Um, and here we go. When I interviewed Lisa, you know, at the crest of that first generation Ryzen launch, uh, she mentioned how AMD's positioning helped the company to kind of think outside the box to develop its new high performance x86 designs. Um, Now that AMD is claiming market performance leadership, how do AMD's engineering teams kind of stay grounded and continue to drive that out-of-the-box thinking? I'm very proud. Um, They're one of the most uh, innovative engineering teams in the industry. Uh, So this was a hard-fought battle to get uh, into this leadership uh, position with Zen 3, Uh, And I can tell you, we have a very, very strong roadmap going forward. Uh, The team, indeed, is staying very, very grounded. Uh, You look at the kind of approaches uh, that we took on Zen 3, uh, you know, it wasn't any one, you know, silver bullet that delivered the performance. It was uh, really touching almost every unit uh, across our CPU, uh, and the team did an excellent job of driving uh, improvements in performance, Uh, improvements in efficiency, uh, reducing the latency to memory, uh, and providing, you know, just a a tremendous uh, improvement in performance, 19% in a single generation uh, of instruction per clock over our previous uh, Zen 2, previous uh, generation, which was Zen 2, released just mid of last year. So, uh, you know, it it was a, a, a phenomenal achievement, and it's that focused on, I'll just say, hardcore engineering uh, that the team will continue going forward. Uh, It won't be about silver bullets. It will be about uh, continuing uh, to provide a real-world performance gains to our customers. Um, So to highlight that 19% value, um, two of the highlights have been this 90% raw increase in performance per clock, but also the new core complex design with uh, 8 cores and 32 megs of L3. Um, To what extent is this larger core complex helping with that raw performance increase, or are there other substantial benefits in the design by moving to this combined CCX? Yeah, the the change in the uh, uh, basic construct of the the core complex uh, was uh, very, very important in allowing us to uh, realize uh, reductions and latency to memory, which uh, is huge for gaming. Again, gaming is a a huge market force and high-performance desktop. And games typically have a dominant thread. And so that dominant thread, uh, its its performance is very uh, dependent on on the cache available to it, the L3 cache available to it. Because if it can hit in that local L3 cache, obviously it's not traversing all the way out uh, to main memory. So by reorganizing our core complex uh, and doubling it uh, from four cores that have direct access uh, to what uh, in a previous generation was a 16 megabyte L3 cache, uh, by now having eight cores which have direct access to a 32 megabyte of L3 cache uh, you really, uh, it's the single biggest lever in, in reducing latency. Obviously, when you hit in the cache, 
you 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 provide effective latency. You you know uh, you're you're um, improving directly improving performance. Uh, so it it was um, it was a big lever for gaming, uh, but we had a, a, a number of levers uh, behind that. Again, uh, we really touched uh, every unit in the CPU. Um, so doubling that L3 uh, cache access for each core, you know, from that 16 meg to the 32 meg, you know, is a leap, is a sizable leap. I'll, I'll you know grant you that. Um, and this does improve you know overall latency up to 32 megabytes, as you've said before. So we don't need to go out to main memory. Um, but has doubling the size affected that L3 latency range at all? There are obviously trade-offs when you uh, double that L3 cache, especially when you've got more cores accessing it. No, we, uh, the the uh, team did an excellent job uh, on on engineering logically and physically. Uh, that's always a key. Is is you know how um, uh, to architect the reorganization. So to change the logic to support this new structure and equally focus on the physical implementation. Uh, you know, not adding, uh, uh, you know, how do you optimize layout so you're not adding uh, stages of delay that would, uh, you know, effectively neuter <laughs> the, the gain. So, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was tremendous uh, engineering um, uh, on uh, the uh, reorganization of the Zen 3 core uh, that, that uh, you know, truly delivers the benefit and reduced latency. Uh, I'll go beyond that uh, as we talk about that uh, physical implementation. Uh, the, the, the normal thinking would be when you add the amount of logic changes that we did, uh, Ian, to achieve that 19% structure per clock, uh, normally, of course, um, the power envelope is going to go way up. We didn't change technology nodes. We stayed in 7 nanometer. Uh, so, you know, I think... Um, I think, you know, your, your, your readers would probably naturally assume that therefore we went up uh, significantly in, in power. Uh, but the team uh, did a phenomenal job of uh, managing uh, not, not just the new core complex, but across every aspect of implementation and kept Zen 3 in the power envelope uh, that we had been in Zen 2. So when you look at uh, Ryzen uh, as it rolls out, uh, we're able to stay uh, in that same AM4 socket and that same power envelope and yet uh, deliver uh, these very, very significant performance gains. Um, so speaking to the process node, um, TSMC 7 nanometer, as you said, um, we've specifically been told that it's this sort of minor process update that was used for Ryzen 3000 XT. Um, are there any additional benefits that Ryzen 5000 is getting through the manufacturing process that perhaps we're not aware of? Well, it's the same. It is, a, in fact, uh, uh, the core is in the same seven nanometer node, meaning the uh, the process design kit is the same. So, if you look at the transistors, uh, you know they um, uh, have the same uh, design guidelines from the fab. Uh, what uh, happens, of course, in any uh, semiconductor fabrication node is they're able to make adjustments in their manufacturing process. So that, of course, they've done. Their uh, uh, yield improves. Uh, you know, every every quarter, um, you know, the process uh, variation is reduced over time. So those are the type when uh, when you when you hear minor variations uh, of seven nanometer, that's what's being referred to. Moving from Zen two to Zen three, um, the the headline number in performance per watt that AMD is promoting is that twenty four percent. You know, on top of the nineteen percent IPC. Um, which obviously means that there have been additional enhancements made at the power delivery level. Can you talk to any of those? We have a um, tremendous focus on our power management. We have uh, uh, an entire microcontroller and power management schema uh, that we have across the entire uh, CPU. Uh, and we enhance that every generation. Uh, so uh, very proud of what uh, the, the Zen 3 team has done uh, to achieve this 24% uh, uh, power improvements. Uh, it is uh, yet more advances uh, in uh, our whole precision boost uh, to give us more granularity uh, in, in managing both frequency and voltage while constantly uh, listening to the myriad of sensors uh, that we have in the chip. So it's uh, it's yet more granularity in the adaptability of our power management to the workload that our our users are running on our microprocessor. So it's 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 more responsive, 
and it de- and and being more responsive, it's delivering more efficiency. Um, one of the points we we noticed on Zen two was the relatively high idle power draw of the I/O die, kind of anywhere from thirteen watts to twenty watts. Um, we've been told that the I/O die this time around is is the same I/O die used in Zen two. Um, but we just want to confirm, does anything change with Zen 3, given, you know, as you've said, the focus on power efficiency and performance per watt? Or is it, you know, simply the same design for, combat- for compatibility or, say, cost effectiveness? Yeah, I mean, you know, these are uh, incremental uh, advan- advancements on the on the IO die. Uh, uh, so, you know, it, uh, that allowed us, uh, by the way, uh, to give a, our, our, uh, our customers in uh, high-performance desktop of the ability to leverage that AM4 socket while uh, getting these performance gains. So it, uh, th- that was a very uh, a calculated a move uh, to deliver CPU performance while giving continuity uh, to our to our customer base. Uh, so the um, you know we we're constantly uh, uh, driving uh, power efficiency uh, with Zen3. Uh, the focus was on uh, you know the the uh, the core and the core cache complex and driving, uh, you know, the bulk of our, our uh, power efficiency. Can you talk about AMD's goals with regards to IO and power consumption? I mean, we've seen AMD deliver uh, PCI Gen 4 in 7 nanometer, um, but we're still IO dies based on 12 and 14 nanometers from global foundries. Um, I assume, you know, it's a key target for improvements uh, in the future, just perhaps not this time around. Yeah, it's it's generational. So as we go, uh, you know, if you look to the future, uh, we drive uh, in- improvements on efficiency at every generation. So when you see AMD uh, transition to uh, PCI Gen 5 uh, and that whole ecosystem, uh, you should expect uh, to uh, hear from us on our next round of uh, generational improvements uh, ac- across uh, both next generation uh, uh, core that's in design, uh, as well as that next generation uh, I.O. And, uh, and, and memory control, control complex. Speaking about the chiplet itself, um, obviously uh, the presentation just gives a sort of like high level view of this, you know, increased core complex. Um, it's, we've noticed that the off chip communication for those chiplets has moved from, say, the center of between the two core complexes to the end. Um, are there ex- any specific benefits to this, such as wire latency or power or? Yes, it, it is. Um, uh, it, it simply uh, you look at that uh, optimization trade off that I described to you of marrying uh, the logical implementation with the physical implementation. So the new uh, cache core complex uh, was designed to minimize uh, the latency from the CPU cores themselves. Uh, into that cache complex, and to put the uh, control, you know, uh, put uh, other control circuits uh, being uh, uh, placed w- uh, where they, uh, you know, if there is a longer wire length uh, to the less latency sensitive circuits, that's uh, where the trade off would have been made. Over the last couple of years, um, AMD has presented a roadmap for its Infinity Fabric um, design, striving towards, you know, the two typical areas of higher bandwidth and, and better efficiency. Um, does the new Zen 3 and Ryzen 5000 family have any updates to the Infinity Fabric over Zen 2? Uh, we do. We, we've, made, uh, we've made improvements. Uh, you'll see new uh, security uh, elements that we'll be rolling out. We, we boost the security. Uh, we are always tuning uh, our, our Infinity architecture. Uh, you know, this, this, uh, with Zen 3, the focus was on delivering, you know, this leadership raw CPU performance. So in, in terms of in, uh, infinity architecture uh, for our uh, Ryzen desktop, uh, it's, uh, it's incremental, uh, and we'll be rolling out uh, some of those uh, details. We're very excited about it, uh, and it's a great complement uh, to, uh, to the main uh, headline story, uh, which is uh, CPU performance leadership. Um. So with AMD and Intel, um, we're now seeing both companies binning silicon straight from the fab with kind of within an inch of its maximum, um, you know, leaving very little overclocking headroom it's just so users have that peak performance straight out of the box. Um, but from your perspective, how do features like, you know, the precision boost overdrive where frequencies go above that stated range, how do features like that evolve or do they just kind of slowly disappear as uh, 
binning optimization and knowledge increases over time? Well, it, it's of course our goal to maximize uh, what we support with our, our maximum uh, boost frequency. With, uh, with Zen 3, uh, we do increase that to 4.9 uh, gigahertz. And uh, of course, we're improving, you know, we're always um, uh, focused on improving our, our bending. Uh, the way you should think about it is um, we'll always have the best boost frequency uh, that we can provide. Uh, and uh, it's uh, is tested across the full gamut of workloads. Our test suite, uh, you know, it, you know, tries to cover literally uh, every type of workload that we believe our customers, uh, you know, would be uh, able to run on our CPU. But uh, we, ne you know, uh, in, uh, end users are very, very smart, uh, and they may have a segment of those applications. And so our thinking is uh, that we'll continue to provide overclocking uh, so that uh, the enthusiasts that really understand well their workloads and may have a workload that gives them an opportunity, uh, in fact, <laughs> to run uh, even faster, uh, given the unique nature um, of what uh, they're uh, interested in and what, what they're running, uh, we want to give them that flexibility. So, I mean, we've, we've already talked about the, you know, the slight topic of uh, security uh, with relation to the you know, changes to the Infinity Fabric. Um, can you comment on AMD's approaches to you know, the general major topics of security vulnerabilities and if there are any new features inside uh, either Zen 3, the core, or Ryzen 5000 to assist with that? Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll be rolling out more details of that. It'll continue the, the train we've been on. So we've uh, always been a, a security-first approach to our design. We were very, very resilient uh, it's a side channel attacks just based on the, the nature of our microarchitectural implementation. The way that we implemented uh, x86 uh, was very, very strong. Uh, we had, have had uh, great uh, success and uptake of the uh, encryption capability we have, uh, both across our whole memory space or our ability to encrypt uh, unique instances of virtualization. Uh, and we'll continue uh, that uh, track with Zen 3. Uh, so we'll uh, have more details uh, forthcoming in, in, in the uh, coming weeks, uh, but what you'll see is uh, enhancements um, and it, that uh, further protect, um, you know, uh, against uh, uh, other uh, rogue elements out there like uh, return-oriented programming uh, and other, other facets that, uh, that you have seen uh, bad actors uh, you know, trying to take advantage of uh, out there in industry. Would you say the focus of those security enhancements is necessary towards the enterprise rather than the consumer, just due, just due to the different environments? I mean, how does AMD approach, do they approach the market separately, or is it just as much security as we can provide for both at once? Yeah, we, we generally try and think about what is the best security that we can provide across the uh, full uh, array of, uh, of end applications. Of course, uh, enterprises um, uh, uh, typically, um, you know, will have uh, a higher focus on security. Uh, but I, I believe that's changed over time. And, you know, uh, everyone, whether you're running, uh, you know, your uh, uh, CPU, uh, uh, high performance application for uh, content creation, uh, computation, gaming, uh, I believe security is foundational. And so uh, although uh, it has historically been the focus of enterprise in, uh, I now believe uh, in, and, and certainly drives our approach of rolling out uh, security uh, enhancements or, uh, as best we can across uh, all of our products, we believe it's foundational. Um, go going back to the 19% IPC uplift, um, part of the presentation, AMD's kind of broken down where it believes those separate percentages come from with different parts of the architecture. Um, it's very clear that the updates to load store units on the front end contribute perhaps half of that benefit with, say, micro cache and prefetches uh, populating the other half. Um, can you at least go into some slight detail about what's changed in load store and front end? Um, I know you're planning to do a more deeper dive into the micro architecture. Um, as we go through to launch, but is there anything you can say at this time? You know, just give, perhaps give us a teaser. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it, the load store enhancements were extensive, and and um, it is uh, certainly highly uh, impactful, uh, and and uh, it's 
role it plays in delivering the 19% uh, instruction per clock. Uh, you know, it, it, it's really about uh, the, the kind of throughput uh, that we can uh, breed in to bring into our execution u- units. So when we widen our execution units and we widen the, uh, you know, the issue rate uh, into our uh, execution units, um, you know, you, you know it's a, it is one of the, in fact, uh, key levers uh, that we can uh, bring to bear. Uh, so what you'll see uh, as we roll out details uh, that we uh, have increased um, uh, our throughput on both uh, uh, loads per cycle and store per cycle. Again, we'll, we'll be having uh, more details coming uh, shortly. Um, is it easy enough uh, to manage? Obviously, the wider you make a processor, um, you'll start looking at a static power and active power. Um, is that just... Um, spending more focus on the physical design to keep that power down? Uh, It's it's a combination of physical and logic design. So again, uh, this is uh, what I think many people may miss uh, in the story of Zen 3 as we roll it out. Uh, The the beauty of this design is in fact uh, the balance of bringing uh, extensive changes to drive up the performance uh, while uh, increasing the power management uh, 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 controls and the physical implementation uh, to allow uh, the uh, same uh, typical, uh, I'll say, power uh, switching uh, per cycle as we had in the previous generation. That's quite a feat. Um, so Zen 3 is now third major architectural iteration to the Zen family and we've seen on roadmaps AMD talk about Zen 4 and you know potentially even Zen 5. Um, former employee uh, Jim Keller has famously said that iterating on a design is key to getting that you know low-hanging fruit but at some point you have to start from scratch on the base design. Uh, we've all seen you know AMD's previous timelines uh, going through bulldozer to Zen and now we're three or four years into Zen that third generation. Um, can you sort of comment on how AMD approaches both next iterations of Zen while also thinking about perhaps that next big ground up redesign? Zen 3 uh, is in fact uh, redesigned. So it's part of the Zen family. Uh, so uh, we didn't change, I'll call it the, um, uh, the implementation approach at, at 100,000 feet. Uh, so if you, you know, if you're flying over a landscape, you can say I'm, I'm, I'm still in the same territory I was. But as you as you drop down and you look at uh, the implementation and literally across all of our execution units, so Zen 3 is not a derivative design. Uh, Zen 3 is redesigned uh, to deliver a maximum of, of uh, performance gain uh, while staying in, in, in the same semiconductor node as its, uh, as its predecessor. So x86 market for AMD, uh, very competitive both in client and enterprise. Um, but we are seeing increasing pressure from the ARM ecosystem in both markets. It's hard to deny that. Um, Arms recently announced um, its roadmaps showing you know Neoverse matching x86 levels of IPC and then 30% year-on-year architectural advancements, arguably at a fraction of the power that x86 runs at. We all know that AMD's goals since its reintroduction into the high-performance x86 space has been you know, achieving that peak performance, which you, you seem to have got with Zen 3. But how does AMD intend to combat, um, a, you know, upcoming up non-86, not, not, non-X86 x um, players, especially if they're starting to promise uh, in their roadmaps more and more performance that perhaps AMD's roadmaps suggest? We won't let our foot off the gas pedal on performance. It's not about instruction set architecture. Any instruction set architecture, once you uh, set your site on high performance, you're going to be adding transistors to be able to achieve uh, that performance. Uh, and so uh, there, you know, there are some uh, differences uh, between one ISA and another, uh, but that's not that's not fundamental. We we chose x86 uh, for our designs uh, because of the vast. Uh, software install base, the vast uh, tool chain out there, and so it's x86 uh, that uh, that we chose uh, to optimize uh, for performance. Uh, that gives us uh, uh, the fastest path to adoption in, in the industry. Uh, and so we we 
uh, have historically lived in nothing but a competitive environment. Uh, we don't expect that to change going forward. Uh, so our view is very simply that the uh, 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 the best uh, uh, defense is in fact a strong offense. We're we're not <laughs> we're not letting up. Massive uh, raw performance increases with um, with Zen three. Though there hasn't been much talk about hey how AMD is approaching uh, CPU based AI acceleration. I mean, is it simply a case of having all these cores and the strong floating point performance? Or is there scope for on-die acceleration or optimized instructions? Our focus in on Zen 3 has been raw performance. Again, we uh, Zen 2 uh, had a number of areas of leadership performance. Uh, and our goal in transition to Zen 3 was to have absolute performance leadership. Uh, so that's what we focused across this design. Uh, it does include floating point. Um, and so, you know, with improvements that uh, we made uh, to the um, uh, uh, floating point and our multiply accumulate units, um, it, it's going to help uh, vector workloads. It's going to help, uh, you know, AI, uh, you know, uh, workloads such as inferencing, which often run on, on the CPU. Uh, so, again, we're going to address um, uh, in a broad uh, swatch of, of uh, you know, really uh, all of the ro workloads. As well, we've increased frequency, which is a tide that, uh, <laughs> with our max boost frequency, it's a tide that raises uh, all, all boats. Uh, we're not an, uh, announcing a, a new uh, math format at this time. Has AMD already prepared accelerated libraries for Zen 3 with regard to AI workloads? We do. Uh, we have uh, math kernel libraries, uh, which, which optimize around Zen 3. Uh, that will be all part of the, uh, 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 the uh, rollout uh, as the year continues. So moving to competitive analysis, has the nature or approach of AMD's competitive analysis um, on processes changed since that sort of first generation of Zen to where we sit today and where AMD is going forward? We uh, have consistently uh, kept a uh, clear focus on uh, the competition. Uh, and we look, um, you know, across our x86 competitor. Uh, we look at, um, uh, you know, any uh, emerging uh, competitors are using alternate ISAs, uh, so uh, no no change. Uh, one thing uh, that uh, we believe is uh, you you uh, always have to do two things. Uh, one, listen to your customers, uh, understand where their workloads are going, uh, where where their um, uh, needs uh, may be evolving over time, and then secondly, uh, keep an eye a constant eye on the competition. Uh, and again, uh, that uh, is a key part of what got us to the leadership position with Zen 3 uh, and an element of our uh, CPU design culture uh, that will not change going forward. So a lot of success with uh, Zen 2 and, and um, both Ryzen and Epic has been you know, the chiplet approach. Tiny chiplets, high yield can also be binned for frequency very well. Um, however, we're starting to see sort of large monolithic silicon being produced at TSMC now, especially on seven nanometer, uh, with some with some of TSMC's customers going kind of you know beyond six hundred square millimeters. Uh, AMD's in a position now where revenues are growing, market shares growing, and now it comes out with a product like Ryzen five thousand. Um, where, where do AMD's thoughts lie on producing CPU core chiplets um, on a larger scale? I mean, ultimately, you can't end up with a million chiplets on a package. <laughs> well, we innovated uh, in the industry with uh, chiplets, and in, and as you saw uh, last year, as we rolled out our uh, our you know Zen two based uh, uh, products in both high performance desktop and server, uh, it gave it gave us a tremendous flexibility, it allowed us to be uh, very very early in the seven nanometer node uh, and achieve manufacturing efficiencies, uh, but also design flexibilities, and. Uh, it is that flexibility going forward uh, that you'll continue to see uh, drive more adoption of chiplets. Uh, we will continue at AMD, and although uh, some of our competitors derided us uh, at our first uh, release of chiplets, uh, frankly, you see uh, most of them adopting this approach. Uh, it's never going to be uh, one size fits all. So I do believe, uh, you know, based on uh, the uh, market that you're attacking, uh, the 
uh, 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 type of interaction you have across CPU, uh, GPU, and other uh, accelerators uh, will command whether the best approach is, in fact, a chiplet or monolithic. Uh, but chiplets uh, uh, are here to stay. They're here to stay at AMD, and I believe they're here to stay uh, for the industry. So, so it's funny that you mention um, competitors because recently they announced they're moving to a very um, IP block chiplet design scaling is appropriate so say multiple chiplets for cores for graphics for security for io you know, exactly how far down the chiplet rabbit hole do we go here now there's always a balance um uh, a great idea uh, overused can become a bad idea uh, and, and it's really based on each implementation so uh, everyone in the industry uh, is going to have to find their sweet spot uh, because of course um you know there's supply chain complexity that has to be uh, managed. And, and uh, so every, uh, every design uh, that we do at AMD, uh, we're focused on uh, how do we get the best performance uh, in, the, in the best organization physically, how we implement that performance, and ensure that we can deliver it uh, through our supply chain uh, reliably to our customers. Uh, so that, that's the uh, trade-off that we make for each and every product architecture. TSMC recently announced its 3D fabric branding um, covering all aspects of its packaging technology. Um, AMD already implements, you know, simple, what TSMC calls COWAS S in a number of uh, graphics products. However, there are other areas of TSMC's uh, technologies like chip stacking and package integrated interposers. Um, I assume AMD looks at these and considers them for its product, uh, product stack. Uh, can you talk about how AMD goes about that or you know, what's being considered right now? In our uh, approach uh, to packaging is to really partner deeply with the industry, we partner deeply with our foundry partners, uh, with the OSATs. And I truly believe uh, that we're entering a new era of innovation in packaging and interconnect. Uh, and uh, it's going to give um, uh, uh, chip design uh, companies like AMD uh, increasing flexibility going forward. It also creates an environment for increasing collaboration uh, because what you're seeing is the chiplet technology advance uh, such that uh, you can have more flexibility uh, in uh, co-packaging known good dyes. Uh, this was always a dream in the industry. That dream is now becoming reality. So we've seen AMD making inroads into, into other markets where it hasn't been um, as as hasn't had such a high market share, such as Chromebooks um, and uh, AMD's first generation embedded technologies. Um, does AMD continue to go specifically for these markets, or is there untapped potential in markets that AMD hasn't particularly played in, you know, such as IoT or automotive? We continue to look at uh, adjacent markets uh, 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 versus where we play in today. We've been in embedded. Uh, we uh, are growing share in embedded, uh, so that uh, certainly continues to be a focus at AMD. Uh, uh, what we're not doing is uh, going after, I'll call it, uh, the, the um, markets that may have a lot of media attention but that aren't uh, well matched to the kind of high performance uh, incredible focus that we have at AMD. Uh, we want to deliver uh, high performance uh, at a value to the industry. Uh, and so we will continue uh, to put our energies uh, into growing our share uh, in those markets that really value uh, what we can bring to the table. After the discussion with Mark, I'm really looking forward to getting my hands on these uh, Zen 3 products, having a go through the microarchitecture with the engineers, and just seeing how much performance these new processors actually built. You know, plus 19% IPC, if that claim is true, it's going to be amazing. Um, but wait until the results. Everybody, hold your horses. Wait until the results. Um, November 5th is the day to look out for.